I can't tell you what a thrill it is for me, Richard Bewes, the rector of All Souls Church in Langham Place, here in London, England, to welcome you to the fourth and last lecture of the London Lecture Series that is being put on this year. John Stott, of course, is the lecturer, and we've been taking the theme of the incomparable Christ over these past three lectures. As we come now to the end, we're looking particularly at the theme of the eternal Jesus. As we think of how Jesus, from those early days of the persecuted Christians in the Roman Empire, right through to the present day, has sustained the Christians and the saints of every age with a knowledge of his presence and his inspiring comfort and triumph and victory. And we're particularly, I think, going to be looking tonight at the book of Revelation. So welcome to these lectures. At about the halfway stage, I think we might be taking a little break. Let's enjoy the lecture now. Well, ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, as I would prefer to address you, I'm deeply grateful for your welcome. Now, in the first lecture, we considered how the New Testament witnesses to Jesus Christ. In the second and third lectures, we've been immersed in church history. We've seen how the church has presented Christ and how Christ has inspired the church. And now in the last lecture tonight, we return to the New Testament and in particular to the book of Revelation. It is almost mad that I should attempt to expand the whole book of Revelation in one lecture. But I think and hope you will see that there is method in my madness. Reactions to the book of Revelation are extremely varied. Some Christians are positively obsessed with it, supposing that it contains a secret history of the world. Others avoid it because of its bizarre imagery, <clears throat> such as the lion and the lamb, and the great red dragon. But a third and positive reaction is exemplified by Professor Richard Borkham, who is a scholarly specialist in the book of Revelation. He writes these words, the Apocalypse of John is a work of immense learning, astonishingly meticulous literary artistry, remarkable creative imagination, radical political critique and profound theology. And this expert evaluation will, I think, encourage us to persevere. But before proceeding further, it would be wise for us to heed four principles of interpretation. First, the book of Revelation is full of symbolism, and its symbols are to be interpreted rather than visualized. <clears throat> if we to attempt, were to attempt to visualize them, the result would often be grotesque. For example, God's redeemed people are said to be wearing robes which have been made white in the blood of the Lamb. Well, I confess I've never attempted to launder dirty linen in Lamb's blood, but I'm quite sure if I did so, it wouldn't come out white. But the interpretation, rather than the visualization, is very beautiful, namely that the only righteousness that qualifies us to stand before the throne of God is due to the atoning death, the blood of Jesus Christ, in whom we have come to put our trust. Secondly, the book of Revelation addresses the past, the present, and the future. The so-called preterist view regards almost all the book as alluding to the past, in fact, particularly to events of the first century AD. The historicist view reads the book as telling the story of the church down the centuries. The futurist view expects most of the book to be fulfilled immediately before the parousia, that is the second coming of Jesus Christ. But it seems to me much better to adopt what is sometimes called a parallelist view. That is to say, it sees every section of the book 
as recapitulating the whole period between the first and the second comings of Christ. Thirdly, the book of Revelation celebrates the victory of God. It depicts the conflict between God and Satan, between the lamb and the dragon, between the holy city Jerusalem and the great city Babylon. But the revelation does more than depict conflict. It celebrates conquest. And I think we may say that the major perspective of the book of Revelation is that Jesus Christ has already conquered and is the victorious one. Professor Sweet, at the beginning of the 20th century, wrote, the book, the whole book, is a sursum corda, a summons to Christian believers to lift up their hearts and to see their tribulations in relation to the victorious Jesus Christ. Fourthly, and most important of all, the book of Revelation focuses on Jesus Christ. The first three words of the book's Greek text are apocalypsis, Jesu Christu. That is an apocalypse or a revelation of Jesus Christ. Because what a beleaguered and persecuted church needs more than anything else is not a history of the world in cipher, but rather a disclosure of the incomparable Christ, once crucified, now resurrected and reigning, and one day coming again in power and great glory. So my plan tonight is to concentrate on the eight most striking Christological visions in the book of Revelation, each of which contributes something fresh to its composite revelation of Jesus Christ in the fullness of his person and work. So in vision one, I hope you have your outline. We see Christ claiming to be the first and the last and the living one in chapter one. John sets the scene for this first and defining vision of the glorified Jesus Christ. It was a Sunday, he says. He was on, in exile on the island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. And uh, he was in the spirit as the revealing and inspiring spirit took hold of him in this vision. And he saw someone like a son of man, that is like a human being. John describes various parts of his body. His head and his hair were white as snow, which was Daniel's description of God. So when transferred to Jesus Christ, it shows that he is not only a human figure, but a divine figure as well. And then he goes on, his eyes blazed like fire, his feet were strong and stable as brass, his voice was as loud as the breakers crashing on the cliffs of Patmos. And in his right hand, the Son of Man was holding seven stars, symbolic, it seems, of the local church leaders to whom he is writing. And out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword, symbolizing his powerful message and his face shone like the sun in all its brilliance. It's not surprising, I think, that in reaction to this vision of Christ, John should fall prostrate at his feet as if he were dead. Although not surprising, it's rather anomalous, for he lay dead at the feet of the living one. But the same Christ placed his right hand on John and said to him, don't be afraid. But surely he had every reason to be afraid. He was in exile. The Emperor Domitian was on the throne and was demanding to be addressed as Dominus et Deus Noster, our Lord and God. But no Christian who had confessed that Jesus was Lord and God could ever say that the Roman Emperor was Lord and God. And already a man called Antipas in Pergamum had paid for his faithful witness with his blood. John must have been asking himself, who is next in the Allen annals of Christian martyrdom? Well, in such a situation of danger, Christ's message is more than a command not to be afraid. It includes also the basis 
for Christian courage and fearlessness, namely that Christ shares in the eternity of God. I am the first and the last, he says. And again, I am the living one. I was dead, but behold, I am alive forevermore. So because Christ is both the eternal one and the resurrected one, death has lost its terrors and we have no reason to be afraid. Vision one. In vision two, we see Christ supervising his churches on earth, chapters two and three. The scene changes. Our vision is now focused not on the glorious divine human figure of Jesus, but on the churches among which we're told he walks. Our vision is of Christ walking among the churches on earth. Well, I expect all of us are familiar with the letters to the seven churches. They have an identical outline, but each has a different characteristic, which and the seven together seem to form the marks of an ideal church. The first is love. What else could it be but love? The church in Ephesus had much to commend it. Christ knew its hard work and perseverance, its intolerant attitude to evil, and its theological discernment. But Jesus said, this complaint, you have forsaken your first love. And all the Ephesians' virtues did not compensate for this lack. Without love, everything is nothing. The second mark of a living church is suffering. Indeed, a willingness to suffer for Christ proves the genuineness of our love for him. Christ knew the afflictions and the poverty and the slander which the church in Smyrna was having to endure. Possibly these sufferings were associated with the local emperor cult because Smyrna boasted of her temple in honor of the emperor Tiberius. From time to time, the citizens of the town were invited to parade in the forum were invited further to sprinkle a little incense on the fire burning before the bust of the emperor and to say the words, Curios, Kaiser, Caesar is Lord. But how could Christians call Caesar Lord when they had confessed that Jesus was Lord? Be faithful even to the point of death was Jesus' me message to Smyrna. Thirdly, the church in Pergamum was dedicated to truth because in spite of opposition and even of the martyrdom of Antipas, the church had remained true to Christ's name and had not renounced its faith in him. Jesus' fourth letter was addressed to the church in Thyatira. Jesus began with the warmest commendation. But unfortunately, alongside the church's sterling Christian qualities, it was guilty of moral compromise, as I fear many churches are today. It tolerated a self-styled prophetess who was leading Christ's servants astray into immorality and idolatry. Tolerance is not a virtue when it is evil that is being tolerated. Holiness is an essential mark of a living church. Christ's fifth letter was to Sardis. It's the only letter that contains no commendation of any kind. Instead, Jesus complains, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. And scripture has much to say about the difference between reputation on the one hand and reality on the other, between what human beings see on the one hand and what God sees on the other. To be obsessed with outward appearance leads naturally to hypocrisy, whereas Jesus Christ wants sincerity to be a mark of his church. In the sixth letter addressed to Philadelphia, Jesus said, see, I placed before you an open door that nobody is able to shut. It was probably the open door of opportunity because outreach and mission is another mark of a true and living church. Well, there can be no doubt 
about the seventh message of Christ, this time to the, his letter to the church in Laodicea. He wants his church to be characterized by wholeheartedness. He is very outspoken. He says he would prefer his disciples to be either hot or cold. He finds tepidity nauseating. Thus, the risen Lord reveals himself as the chief pastor of his flock, patrolling, inspecting, supervising his churches. He has an intimate knowledge of them. He's able to pinpoint the seven marks that he would like every church to display. Love for him and willingness to suffer for him. Truth of doctrine and holiness of life. Commitment to mission, together with both sincerity and wholeheartedness in everything. Vision two. In vision three, we see Christ sharing God's throne in heaven. Chapters 4 and 5. With Revelation 4, we turn abruptly from the church on earth to the church in heaven, from Christ among the flickering lampstands of his churches to, at, to, to Christ in the very center of the eternal throne of God. It's the same Christ, but from a different perspective. Chapter 4, verse 1, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and John peeped through the door. What did he see? First, a throne from which God rules the universe. Second, a scroll, the book of history, closed, sealed, and held in God's right hand. Thirdly, a lamb, as if it had been slain. Jesus Christ himself, who alone is worthy to open the scroll, to interpret and to control history. First then came John's vision of the throne. When John peeped through the open door, the very first thing that his eye lit upon was a throne, symbol of the majesty and the kingly rule of Almighty God. The churches of Asia were small and struggling. The might of Rome seemed inexhaustible. What could a few defenseless Christians do if an imperial edict were to banish them from the face of the earth? Yet they need not be afraid, for at the center of the universe there is a throne. And everything John saw in his vision was related to the throne of God, as indicated by seven prepositions. First, on the throne, somebody was sitting. Its occupant is not described because God is indescribable. Secondly, Encircling the throne is an emerald rainbow symbolizing God's covenant mercy. Thirdly, surrounding the throne were 24 elders, presumably representing the 12 tribal heads of Israel and the 12 apostles of Christ, making 24 or the complete church of God, Old and New Testaments together. Fourthly, from the throne issued flashes of lightning rumblings and peals of thunder, tokens of the presence and power of the God of Mount Sinai. Then fifthly, before the throne, seven lamps were blazing, identified as the seven spirits of God, namely the Holy Spirit, in his many ministries, not least in relation to the seven churches. Six, in front of the throne, there stretched a vast expanse like a sea of glass, speaking of God's transcendence and unapproachability. And seven, in the center, around the throne, as a kind of inner circle where four living creatures, they resembled a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle, representing, as one commentator has put it, whatever is noblest, strongest, wisest, and swiftest in animate nature. So day and night, all nature never ceases to sing the praises of the Lord God Almighty. Now, you and I, when we think about heaven, tend to concentrate on negative phrases like, there will be no more tears. But John focuses not so much on the absences in heaven as on the cause of their absence, namely the central 
dominating presence of the throne of God. Well, John's attention now moves from the throne to the scroll, which is held in the right hand of God. There seems to be nobody worthy to open or break the scrolls. That is to say, to disclose and control the future. So John wept and wept. And then one of the angels, or elders, told John not to weep, and added, see, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, expressions for the Messiah, he has triumphed, and he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals, and so to reveal the contents and the meaning of history. It is a dramatic moment. John looks to see this triumphant lion, and to his astonishment, what he sees is not a lion at all, but a lamb, looking as if he had been slaughtered, yet standing in the very center of the throne of God, sharing the throne with God. Thus, our attention is redirected from the throne to the scroll, and now from the scroll to the lamb. For the lamb now takes the scroll from the hands of uh, that, that is holding it out to him, for the Lamb takes it from God's right hand. And at this sing signal, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fall prostrate before God and sing a new song, declaring his worthiness to take the scroll and open its seals, not now because of the creation, but because of the redemption. For you were slain, they sing, and by your blood on the cross, you were purchased for God from e you purchased men from God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And chapter five ends with the most magnificent vision of the whole creation on their faces before God and his Christ. Friends, it is truly amazing that the lamb is bracketed with the occupant of the throne as receiving equal praise. The worship of Christ quite clearly indicates who he is, because we only worship God. But why is the Lamb alone worthy to open the scroll? Well, perhaps the answer is in this profound paradox, that the slain Lamb, symbol of weakness, stands at the center of God's throne, which is the symbol of power. In other words, power through weakness, dramatized in the Lamb on the throne, lies at the very heart of ultimate reality, and even, perhaps, of the mystery of Almighty God himself. Vision three. In vision four, we see Christ controlling the course of history, chapters 6 and 7. John now watches as the Lamb breaks the seven seals one by one. And after each is broken, each of the first four is broken, one of the living creatures shouts in a voice like thunder, Come! And behold, a horse and its rider appear. These are the famous four horsemen of the apocalypse, with well-known to Christian artists. The first horse was white. Its rider held a bow and was given a crown and rode out, we are told, as a conqueror bent on conquest. Well, because he belongs to the series of apocalyptic horsemen, many commentators conclude that he too symbolizes disaster. In his case, probably military conquest. But throughout Revelation, crowns and conquests belong to Christ. And in chapter 19 of Revelation, the rider on the white horse is definitely Christ. So I myself am persuaded that this is Christ too, the rider on the white horse. And in this way, we are assured that before the other horsemen spread the horrors of war and famine and death, Christ rides first at the head of the cavalcade in order to conquer the world to his allegiance, and he succeeds. He wins the nations by the gospel. For in chapter seven, we see a countless multitude that nobody can number standing before God's throne, 
drawn from all nations, the fruit of Christ's international mission. Well, the second horse is fiery, fiery red, symbolizing bloodshed, whether war or civil strife or persecution. The third horse is black, symbolizing famine conditions, as rocketing inflation makes even stable foodstuffs too expensive to buy. The fourth horse is pale green, the color of a corpse, because he symbolizes death and Hades. And these three are given authority over a quarter of the population to kill by sword, famine, plague, and wild animals. They seem to represent the human violence and the natural disasters that have been experienced century after century in the Christian era. Now next we note that the breaking of the fifth seal reveals the souls of the Christian martyrs under the altar, which is the place of sacrifice. They were appealing for justice. As George Eldon Laird, a commentator, has said, it's the blood of the martyrs crying for vindication. It's not the martyrs themselves crying for personal vengeance. And in response, they were told to wait a little longer until the tally of the martyrs is complete. Well, after the breaking of the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake, followed by the most appalling cosmic convulsions. The sun turned black and the moon red, the stars fell and the sky disintegrated, and every mountain and island was dislodged. These are not to be interpreted as literal events, however, but as social and political upheavals, described in very familiar apocalyptic imagery. Indeed, the whole period between the first coming and the second coming of Christ will be a time of violent disturbance and suffering, as we know. But the eye of faith looks beyond these things to the Lamb on the throne who breaks the seals, controlling the course of history. John now treats us, treats us to a welcome interlude which stresses the security of the people of God. Revelation chapter 7 describes two human communities, the first numbering 144,000 and drawn from the 12 tribes of Israel, and the other a huge unnumbered multitude drawn from all the nations. These are surely two pictures of the same redeemed people of God. Although viewed from different perspectives, in the first, the people are assembled like soldiers in battle array, the church militant on earth, but in the second, they are assembled before God, their conflicts over the church triumphant in heaven. Now we come on to vision five. We see Christ calling the world to repentance. But what is the evidence somebody here may be asking that the dominant theme of the book of Revelation, chapters 8 to 11, is a call to repentance and a warning of judgment. What is the evidence? It's threefold. First, John describes the blowing of seven trumpets. And one of the chief functions of the trumpet in the Old Testament was to warn people of impending disaster. Secondly, the seven trumpet judgments resemble very closely the plagues in Egypt in the time of Moses, and their purpose was to bring Pharaoh and his court to repentance. Thirdly, the world's negative response to the trumpet shows that repentance is what had been hoped for. We read in chapter 9, the rest of mankind still did not repent. In spite of continuous divine warnings, they remained defiantly impenitent. Well, the calamities that are now listed when the trumpets are blown are natural disasters which may occur to anybody at any time in any place, but they can also be read and understood as warnings. In the same way that Jesus interpreted the collapse of the Tower of Siloam as a call to repentance. He said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Next, 
When the fifth trumpet sounds, John sees a swarm of locust-like creatures coming up out of the open abyss and darkening the sun and the sky. But what impresses John most is their power to inflict pain. Three times he tells us that they sting like a scorpion, and three times he refers to their ability to cause agony and torment, causing pain so acute that their victims long to die. Professor Thomas Torrance, the well-known Scottish theologian, suggests that the bottomless pit is a symbol for the depravity of human nature, which convicts us painfully of sin, for there is no pain more pa painful than that of a tormented conscience. Well, the calamities associated with the seven trumpets seem to be God's indirect warnings, but now they are supplemented by his direct warnings. In the church's proclamation of the gospel, which is symbolized in chapters 10 and 11. First by a little scroll, which seems to contain the gospel, which John had to eat and inwardly digest before he could preach it, and then by the appearance of two witnesses who seem to be symbols of the preaching church. This development is introduced by another mighty angel coming down from heaven, we're told, who planted one foot on the sea and the other foot on the land, so that this colossus bestrides the whole planet with everything under his feet. Who is this? Surely it is the Lord Jesus Christ himself again, the angel of the Lord, as he is sometimes called when appearing in those Old Testament theophanies. Well, a voice now tells John to take Christ's from his open hand, the little scroll that he was holding, to eat it and to digest its contents. Its taste in his mouth, he was assured, would be very sweet, but it would then turn his stomach sour. Jeremiah and Ezekiel before him both had similar experiences, and it is thus that John was recommissioned to preach the gospel to the nations and is warned that if the sweetness of salvation is rejected, it will be followed by the bitterness of judgment. And suddenly now, Christ's two witnesses are introduced with neither warning nor explanation, and their dramatic biography is told. They're given power to prophesy, that is, to preach the gospel. They seem to symbolize the witnessing and suffering church but they will also, we're told, be persecuted. When their testimony is finished, they will be attacked, overpowered, and martyred. And unbelievers will gloat over them and celebrate their death. That is, they will rejoice that their witness had been silenced. And the reason for their glee, it is that the church's faithful witnesses has caused them great torment of mind and of conscience. But after a short period, the martyred and silenced church will be resurrected by God. That is, its testimony will be revived and finally will be exalted to heaven to the consternation of its enemies. So I sum up this uh, last vision, vision five. Christ calls the world to repentance. The trumpets are his warning judgments and the scroll and the two witnesses are the church's faithful preaching of the gospel. Both cause torment in unbelievers. But alas, these painful divine warnings do not lead them to repentance. So now I fear it is too late. And when the seventh trumpet sounds, the end will have come. And there I think we will take our five minute break to give you a chance to wake up if you are asleep <laughs> and to stand and stretch and we'll go on in five minutes time.
And so to part two of The Eternal Jesus, the fourth and final lecture uh, in our series of the London Lectures. We come now, friends, to vision six. And in it we see Christ overcoming the devil and his allies. Revelation 12 to 14. Each time John recapitulates his story, as it stretches from the first coming to the second coming of Christ, there is conflict, victory, and celebration. And this is very clear in these chapters where Christ and the dragon confront one another in combat. So consider with me the dramatist personae in the visions of chapter 12. There are three chief actors in the drama. A pregnant woman entering labor, the male child she bears, and an enormous red dragon. Their identity, when you think about it, is clear. The dragon is that ancient serpent called the devil and Satan. The male child the woman bears is the Messiah, whose destiny is to rule the nations. And the glorious lady who gives birth to the Messiah is the church, the church of the Old Testament, which is in direct continuity with the church of the New Testament. So let's look at that first vision, the vision of the woman, the child, and the dragon. As the woman goes into labor, the dragon stands over her, determined to devour her child the very moment he is born. But when she is delivered, her son is rescued, snatched up to God and his throne. Then the woman, the church, flees to the desert where she will be taken care of during the whole period of her ministry and of her persecution. Secondly, there is the vision of two armies locked in battle. Michael, who is a leading archangel, first mentioned in the book of Daniel, together with his army of good angels, engages the dragon and his demonic forces in war. But the dragon and his forces are defeated, and the great dragon who leads the whole world astray is hurled down to the earth. That is, his power to deceive the nations is broken, as is evident by the mission of the church and the millions who have since been converted to Jesus Christ. Christ's great conquest took place at the cross and at the resurrection and is now celebrated in song. Then there's a third vision, the vision of the dragon's continuing hostility to the woman and his relentless pursuit and persecution of her. It's very meaningful for today. Now, three allies at this point join the dragon and are introduced to us one by one. They're called the beast out of the sea, the sea monster, the beast out of the earth, and Babylon dressed as a gaudy prostitute. They seem to masquerade as a diabolical parody of the Trinity. They also represent the city and empire of Rome, although from three different perspectives. The beast out of the sea represents Rome as a persecuting power. Its ten crowned horns symbolized extraordinary imperial power, and its seven heads, probably the seven hills on which Rome was built. To this first beast, the dragon delegates his authority. The second beast who emerges out of the earth is modest enough to have only one head. At the same time, his voice is as loud and menacing as a dragon's, and maybe as the dragon's, whose representative he is. But who is this second beast who serves the first beast with such uh, sickly obsequiousness? Well, he symbolizes Rome as an idolatrous system, and in particular, maybe the pagan high priest who is responsible for the imperial cult and who persuades people to worship Caesar, so that he is later also called the false prophet. The dragon's third ally is Babylon, the great city, portrayed as a lewd prostitute and representing Rome as a corrupting influence. She's only mentioned here. She is described much more fully later in the book. 
Here then are the dragon's three allies. When John was writing, Rome the persecutor, the first beast, Rome the idolater, the second beast, or false prophet, and Rome the seductress, Babylon the harlot. So the revelation allows us to look behind the scenes and to see the subtle strategy of Satan against the church. All over the world today, the same threefold assault on the church is mounted by the devil. Physical, in the form of persecution. Intellectual, in the form of false teaching. And moral, in the form of compromise. We need to be on our guard. We turn now to the seventh revelation of Jesus Christ. It depicts him in power and great glory, riding in triumph on a white horse, followed by the armies of heaven, destined to be the judge and ruler of the nations, and displaying on his robe that most magnificent of all his titles, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But this vision is not given us until the middle of chapter 19. It seems to serve as the centerpiece of Revelation 15 to 20, a rather long passage, which are six chapters focusing on the righteous judgment of God. I will only mention them now. In chapter 15, we hear the Song of Moses, now renamed the Song of the Lamb, because it celebrates the new exodus, the redemption of the people of God. Chapter 16, the seven bowls of God's wrath are poured out, symbolizing the finality of divine judgment. In chapter, six, in chapter 17 and 18, Babylon is first identified, for John sees her drunk with the blood of the martyrs, and then decisively overthrown. Now, friends, Rome did not actually fall for another 320 years when Alaric the Goth sacked the city. But John is so certain of God's judgment upon evil that he can even announce this future event as having already taken place. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. And now at the beginning of chapter 19, John hears the roar of a huge assembly singing its hallelujah chorus. Five times the word hallelujah is repeated. Why? Partly because God's judgments are true and just, partly because the Lord God Almighty is now reigning, and partly because the wedding of the Lamb has come. And now we are ready to see the rider on the white horse. His names and his description leave us in no doubt whatever of his identity. This is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In the fullness of his divine majesty, Jesus, the just judge, who is preparing to lead the last battle against the forces of evil. Consider his description. His eyes blaze like fire, pierce the secrets of human hearts. He's crowned with many crowns, symbolizing his universal authority. His robe is blood-stained, indicating surely that he carries with him the achievement of his sacrificial death on the cross. The heavenly armies follow him. Like him, they ride on white horses. It is a spectacular picture of our Lord Jesus Christ in glory, power, justice, and authority, coming to be the judge of the world. Consider his four names after his description. First, he is called the faithful and true, for he has never compromised his allegiance to God. Secondly, he has a name written on him that nobody knows but he himself. For however much we may claim to know Jesus Christ, there is still much that we do not know. And not until the last day will we know him as he knows us. Thirdly, his name is the Word of God. Just as we reveal ourselves by our words, so God has revealed himself in his Word, supremely in the Word made flesh, but also in the whole biblical testimony to Jesus, the central figure of it. His fourth name is the most sensational of all. 
Earthly kings and queens, emperors and presidents, exercise a limited rule. But Jesus Christ has been exalted far above all human rule and authority and power and dominion. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now next, John sees the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies assembled to wage war against the rider on the white horse and his army. The dramatic moment has come. The two armies, divine and demonic, are facing one another. It is the very threshold of Armageddon. So what happens next? Answer, nothing. There is no battle, writes Bishop Paul Barnett, only a complete anticlimax, because the battle has already been fought and won at the cross and resurrection of Jesus. No further victory is needed. Instead, the forces of evil are disposed of in the opposite order to their introduction. Babylon has already been overthrown. Now the two beasts are destroyed, leaving the dragon's fate until Revelation 20. Now, Revelation 20 is controversial. It is well known for its reference to a millennium or a 1,000-year period. I am assuming that like all the other enumerations in the book of Revelation, we should not interpret this one literally. It is rather a very long period, though unspecified in length. In fact, the whole gospel age from the first to the second comings of Jesus. Now, it's very important, I think, as we're struggling with uh, Revelation 20, to note that the expression for a thousand years occurs four times. And on each occasion, it has a different reference. First, Satan was bound for a thousand years. Secondly, the nations were no longer deceived until the thousand years were ended. Thirdly, Christ reigned and his resurrected saints and martyrs reigned with him for a thousand years. And fourthly, the same resurrected ones served God and Christ as priests for a thousand years. Now, in the light of these four activities, it seems to me right to affirm that the millennium symbolizes the whole period between the first and second comings of Christ. Because, mark this well, according to the rest of the New Testament, it is during this period that Jesus has bound the strong man, that the nations have been undeceived, so that millions have been converted to Christ, that Jesus and his people are resurrected and reigning with him, and that the, the resurrected ones also serve God and Christ as priests for a thousand years. But when the thousand-year period is over, Satan will be released from his prison for a short time, and he will again deceive the nations throughout the world. And he will gather them for the final battle, but he will again be overthrown and cast into the lake of fire to join the two beasts there in a fate that has neither intermission nor end. The dragon, the two beasts, and the harlot have now all been destroyed. So all opposition to the people of God, whether physical persecution or false ideology or moral compromise, have disappeared with them. But the time has now come for the judgment of individuals. John sees a great white throne and the dead, great and small, are standing before it. There are no absentees and there are no exemptions. The books are opened, both the many books recording the deeds of the dead and the single book of life recording those who belong to the Lamb and whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. It's a solemn moment at the end of Vision 7. We come now to Vision 8, and see Christ coming as the bridegroom to claim his bride. Chapters 21, 22. The whole focus of Revelation 21 and 22 is on life, the book of life, the water of life, and the tree of life. Now, we know, don't we, what eternal life is. 
It begins now and will be consummated in the next world, but this is life eternal, said Jesus, that they will know me or know the Father, know you and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is the personal knowledge of God through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. And so John illustrates this life that is the ultimate and glorious destiny of the people of God. He illustrates it by the use of three distinct metaphors. The first is security in the city of God, that is the New Jerusalem. The second is access to the tree of life in paradise restored. And the third is the intimate relationship of bride and bridegroom in marriage. John has an extraordinary facility for mixing his metaphors. He jumps abruptly from one to another, the city, the garden, the marriage, the wedding, without any apparent sense of incongruity. For all three metaphors represent this close, personal fellowship with God, which begins now and will be consummated when Christ comes. Friends, it is important to affirm that what we are promised at the end is a new heaven and a new earth. That is, not an ethereal heaven, but a renewed universe. Just as the resurrection body will be the same body as this body, with its identity intact, yet invested with new powers, so the new heaven and the new earth will not be a replacement universe, as if created de novo, but a regenerated and glorified universe, liberated from its bondage to decay, purified from all its imperfections, with no more pain or sin or death. Well, after that introduction, the rest of chapters 21 and 22 are devoted in the main to an elaboration of the three metaphors, the city, the garden, and the wedding. First, the city. John tells us the city's dimensions. Have you noticed them? It's about 1,500 miles in length, width, and height. It is a perfect cube, like the Holy of Holies in the temple, indicating that the whole New Jerusalem, the whole city, is the most holy place permeated with the presence of God. We will surely agree with Dr. Bruce Metzger of Princeton Theological Seminary that the New Jerusalem is architecturally preposterous. <laughs> One cannot even conceive an enormous cubed city stretching from London to Athens and from San Francisco to Dallas. But one can understand the symbolism. The New Jerusalem is a massive fortress representing the security, the peace, and the fellowship of the people of God who live in the very presence of God. And the city John saw was beautiful as well as huge and solid, each of its 12 foundations being decorated with a different jewel, each of its 12 gates being made from a single pearl, and the great street of the city being pure gold. Next, John noticed certain absences. First, he says, I did not see a temple in the city. But of course not. The presence of God fills the city. It cannot be localized. There's no need for a building like the temple. Secondly, the city needs neither sun nor moon, since the glory of God illumines it. And had you noticed that it is further illumined by the glory of the nations? We should not hesitate to affirm that the cultural treasures of the world, once purged of everything ugly, false, and evil, will enrich the new Jerusalem. Thirdly, there will be no night there. Consequently, the city's gates will never be shut. They will permit continuous access to the city and to the God who fills it with himself. Fourthly, nothing impure will ever enter the city nor will any body enter who is guilty of shameful or deceitful deeds, but only those who are registered in the Lamb's book of life, the city. Are you ready for the garden? It's emph the emphasis now is on the river of life and on the water of life and the tree of life. The Garden of Eden 
is very evidently in John's mind. First, the angel showed John the river of the water of life. The water, he says, is crystal clear, and it flowed out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, issuing, that is, from his sovereign grace, and it flows down the middle of the city's main street. We're also told that the tree of life is growing on both sides of the river of life, because after the fall, access to the tree of life had been forbidden in Genesis 3, but now the ban is lifted. Ezekiel's vision suggests that many trees of life will line the river bank along its full length so that their fruit will be readily available to everybody. So what does that mean, that symbolism? It means that the hungry may eat and the thirsty may drink to their heart's content. And it brings me to the epilogue, the end of chapter 22. The last 16 verses of the book of Revelation are a kind of appendix or epilogue in which two main themes stand out. First, John is concerned to authenticate his book and to demonstrate its authority. So he insists in these early verses that his words are true, trustworthy, and true. But secondly, we come to the center of this eighth vision, the epilogue is punctuated three times by the grand affirmation of Jesus, behold, I am coming soon. Now the adverb soon means that there is now nothing on God's eschatological timetable before the parousia or second coming of Christ. The parousia is the very next event on his calendar, however long we may have to wait for it. We need to be ready. Well, of John's metaphors of eternal life, the city, the garden, the wedding, each illustrating in a different way the relationship with God which awaits us in the end, the most personal, the most intimate of the three is the union of Christ with his church in terms of the marriage of the bride and the bridegroom. According to Jewish custom, you may well know, a marriage took place in two stages. First came the betrothal, and the wedding followed some time later, and was essentially a public social occasion. It began the marriage with a festive procession, accompanied with music and dancing, in which the bridegroom with his friends went out to fetch his bride, who would have made herself ready for him to come for her. He would then bring her and her friends and relatives back to his home for the wedding feast, which might last as long as a whole week. And during it, the bride and the bridegroom would be escorted to the nuptial chamber, where they would consummate their marriage in the intimacy of physical union. Friends, the Bible betrays no embarrassment whatever about sex and marriage. It is uninhibited in its use of the marriage metaphor to depict the covenant between God and Israel. Yahweh's love for Israel is portrayed in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Hosea in bluntly physical terms. Similarly, Paul, though much maligned as a misogynist, which he undoubtedly was not, portrayed Paul as having loved his bride, the church, and sacrificed himself for her in order that he might present her to himself as an unblemished and radiant church. And when Paul adds this is a profound mystery, it's, he seems to mean that the one flesh experience in marriage symbolizes the union between Christ and his church. Now, it is this same vivid imagery that John, picks up at the end of the book of Revelation. He has already declared in chapter 19 that the wedding of the Lamb has come, that the bride has made herself ready, and that those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb are blessed indeed. But where is the bridegroom? He is nowhere to be seen. It is not for the bride to go in search of her groom. It is for the bridegroom to fetch his bride. She has made herself ready. She's beautifully dressed and bejeweled. But where is he? She can do no more now than wait. 
except that she takes the liberty of expressing her longing for him to come. Verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. For the supreme ministry of the Holy Spirit is to bear witness to Christ, and the supreme desire of the bride, the church, is to welcome her bridegroom. It is thus that the book of Revelation takes leave of the church, waiting, hoping, expecting, longing, the bride eagerly, eagerly looking for her bridegroom, clinging to his threefold promise, behold, I am coming soon, and encouraged by others who echo her call, amen, come, Lord Jesus. Meanwhile, she's confident that his grace will be sufficient for her until the eternal wedding feast begins. And she is united to her bridegroom, the incomparable Christ, forever. We began by attempting to summarize the New Testament witness to Jesus Christ. We continued with the church's presentation of him down the centuries and his influence on the church. And tonight we have returned to the New Testament and to the revelation of Jesus Christ in its last book. I think and hope that we have been impressed by the colorful picture of Jesus Christ, which John has painted in this remarkable book, the eternal Christ who never changes. We see him now supervising his churches on earth and now sharing God's throne in heaven. We see him now controlling the course of history, calling the world to repentance, riding on a white horse to judgment, and promising to come soon to claim and to marry his bride. But how can we come to know him? Is that a question in anybody's mind? This incomparable Christ who has no peers. I want to end this series of lectures with a story which I heard the late Donald Coggan, the late Lord Coggan, speak. He told me afterwards he doesn't know the origin of it, but this is how it goes. There was a sculptor once, so they say, who sculpted a statue of our Lord. And people came from great distances to see it, Christ in all his strength and tenderness. They would walk all round the statue in order to grasp its splendor, looking at it now from this angle and now from that. And yet still its grandeur eluded them until they consulted the sculptor himself. And he would invariably reply, there is only one angle from which this statue may be truly seen. You must kneel. You must kneel. So let's pause for just a moment and to thank God for this lecture. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Lord Jesus Christ, faithful and true Lord, help us, your people, to open our hearts to your love to kneel before you in repentance and faith, and to rise to serve you in the power of your risen life. Bless us, your people, that we may go forth from this place encouraged, strengthened, more greatly determined to serve you and to witness to that compelling love. Who can refuse the incomparable Christ. Bless your servant John. Bless this church. Bless us, your people. Anoint us with your Holy Spirit. Bring more and more people to know the wonder of Christ's love. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.